I'm Taylor. And I'm Kayla. And this is Evidence-Based Talks with Tay and Kay. Welcome to our first ever podcast. We're so excited. We're graduate students from the University of Central Oklahoma. And today we're going to be talking about seeking safety. We're going to talk about what it looks like, who, what it is, and who it helps. We'll also be talking a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder, or what you've probably heard it called as PTSD, and substance abuse disorders. All right, let's get started. So first, um, let's talk about what Seeking Safety is. So Seeking Safety is an integrated treatment package that treats both PTSD and substance abuse at the same time, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Most don't don't do that. So that's a pretty cool feature. So Seeking Safety derives from CBT or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy and from Psychodynamic Theory. It has 25 topics that are split into three sections, cognitive, behavioral, and interpersonal. So um, it was founded by Dr. Lisa Najevitz. She is an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard, and she's also the director of the Trauma Research Program and Alcohol and Drug Abuse Treatment Center at McLean Hospital. So she's pretty accomplished. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, She developed this therapy because she has a family history of PTSD. So her mother and her grandmother were both survivors of the Holocaust. Oh, wow. And she actually experienced PTSD. She um, survived an attempted rape and had her face sliced with a razor. Oh my gosh. So she had some PTSD and some familial, familial PTSD. So she wanted to create a therapy that treated PTSD better than what was already out there. Yeah. So um, she claims that seeking safety came from the emotional work required to overcome the traumas that she experienced in her life. Development for seeking safety um, began in 1993. So they started doing research, which was funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or the NIDA, um, their Behavioral Therapies Development Program. The original studies were done at Harvard Med School and McLean Hospital, which is where Dr. Najevitz works. No, okay. Yes. And um, she draws inspiration. It's not derived from these. These are just what she draws inspiration from, um, from several fields, including substance abuse treatments, PTSD treatments, obviously, Mm -hmm. um, cognitive behavioral therapy, like I said, women's treatments, and educational research. There are five key principles in seeking safety. So the first and the overarching theme is safety as the first priority. Right, of course. Um, and the second principle is an integrated treatment of PTSD and substance abuse, which this is, like I said, unique to seeking mm-hmm. safety. They treat both PTSD and substance abuse at the same time. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more later too. Yes. Like how they are treated duly. Yes, because it's unique mm-hmm. and it works very well for this. <laughs> so um, it also has a focus on ideals. People in this community, um, people with PTSD and substance abuse, a lot of times they've lost like their moral ground. So we're focusing on the ideals of that. There are four content areas. So all of the 25 topics that we'll talk about will be split into these four areas. So it'll be co- cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and then case management. Um, and then the fifth principle, which is again unique to seeking safety it has an attention to the therapist processes so each topic they also give the therapist um a manual that talks about um like counter transference issues and that kind of thing some additional features of seeking safety so they have a lot of use of educational research strategies there's a focus on the potential of the person rather than the pathology of the person um, they pay specific attention to language, which we'll talk about the, that a little bit in a late, later as well. Um, there's an emphasis on practical solutions, so they use real life experiences from the clients mm-hmm. to have them role play and to learn the skills that they're trying to okay. teach. Um, they make sure every topic that they talk about is related specifically to the client's lives by using experiences from them which i'm sure is really helpful for the client yes because they can actually talk about something that's happened to them and how they could handle that situation yeah, better I like that um it has an urgent approach to time so we're looking at the current they don't ever have to talk about their past if they don't want to they only have to talk about the current situation and what is happening with them okay at that time um 
and they make the treatment interesting to the client. Something that's really big in seeking safety is using quotations mm-hmm. throughout the whole thing. Every session you start with a quote and they have the clients relate those to their lives, which is pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. And substance abuse is also considered a priority in this treatment as well, which in some it's PTSD and then they kind of talk about substance abuse right. a little bit or vice versa. Right. So. Kayla just talked about what Seeking Safety is. I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about who it can help. So Seeking Safety, like she said, was created to help individuals with PTSD and substance abuse. And it was actually the first ever treatment package to treat both of them at the same time. So that really is something really individual and unique to Seeking Safety. Um, The research suggests that it is effective in treating adult females, adult males, and recent research has started looking at adolescent females as well. So yeah, it's getting a lot more diverse broad broad, yeah according to the american psychological association the post-traumatic stress disorder or ptsd is a psychiatric disorder that can occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event such as a natural disaster a serious accident a terrorist attack war combat rape or other violent personal assault So PTSD is characterized by um, a few criteria. They have to have been exposed to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. So this could look like having experienced it directly, seeing someone else experience the event, um, learning that it happened to a close friend or family member, and also just being overly exposed to adversive details of a traumatic event. So you think of first responders who have to go and look at a crime scene or just like be exposed to those traumatic things over and over, that would be a criteria that would probably fit them. I think it's interesting that it can also be threatened. Yes, exactly. So they have to have that feeling like that their life was threatened. Um, The next criteria is intrusion. So this is usually just intrusive thoughts. This can be distressing um, like dreams and things like that that um, are intrusive and persistent and are affecting their everyday life. The next is avoidance, and this would be avoiding settings, people, places, even conversations, and things like that, Um, because if you think about it, you know, they've experienced this traumatic event, they're obviously not going to want to go to these, like a place that maybe the event happened, Um, or even this can also really affect your social and occupational, because for like a combat veteran, um, going to work the next day and being surrounded by other veterans might be a trigger for them. The next one is negative alterations in cognitions and mood. And this looks like persistent and exaggerated negative beliefs or expectations about oneself, others, um, or the world. Self-blame regarding the event. And this can also be um, blaming other people that maybe didn't have anything to do with the event, but having just that like blame like inwardly and outwardly. And then just having a persistent negative emotional state. And this would be um, something that wasn't typical for that person. So you would notice this obviously after the event. So if they were kind of had like a depressive symptom like type mood, then they wouldn't, they would have to be like markedly more afterwards um and then the next one and final is arousal so this would be like having a heightened arousal response or like a startle response um having irritable behavior and angry outbursts and then reckless or self-destructive behavior Um, and then all of these would need to last for longer than one month So for PTSD, it's seen more often in veterans and first responders, like I said, like firefighters, police officers, or even just someone who's coming to um, a crime scene first and seeing Mm -hmm. all of it. Um, It's also more among females than among males across the lifespan. And research suggests that this might be attributable to a greater likelihood of exposure to traumatic events like rape and other forms of interpersonal violence. Um, PTSD is associated with high levels of social, occupational, and physical disability, and I kind of touched on this a moment ago, but the social and occupational, if maybe the social occupational, they experience the event there, then they're not going to want to be going there. So that's like the avoidance piece. Um, And also the um, negative alterations in cognitions and mood could really play into this as well. Um, PTSD is also associated with suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So the presence of the disorder alone may indicate which individuals eventually make a suicide plan or actually attempt suicide. 
Okay, so the second feature of seeking safety is substance abuse. The essential feature of a substance abuse disorder is that it's a cluster of cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms indicating that the individual continues using the substance despite significant substance-related problems. And we'll go into that in more detail whenever I talk about the criteria. So substance abuse is categorized into four different categories. The first one is impaired control, and this is like the individual may take the substance in larger amounts or over a long, longer period than was originally intended. Um, they may express a persistent desire to cut down and regulate the substance, but not be able to actually follow through with that. Um, they may spend a great deal of time trying to obtain the substance and also using the substance. And then the craving portion of that is manifested by an intense desire desire or urge for the drug that may occur at any time but is more likely when they're in an environment where they've used before or maybe where they've obtained the drug. Um, the next is social control. It's marked by recurrent substance use and it may result in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or at home. The individual may continue substance use despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological um, problem that's due to the substance right. use. Um, and then the final criteria is pharmacological criteria, and this talks about tolerance and withdrawal. The tolerance piece is signaled by requiring a markedly increased dose of the substance over a period of time. So for example, the first time that someone may drink alcohol, it may only take one drink for them to start to feel the, like, the effects of alcohol, but then as they continue to use, that tolerance builds up mm -hmm. and they need more and more alcohol to mm -hmm. reach that level of intoxication. Um, and then also the next one is withdrawal, and this is a syndrome that occurs when blood or tissue concentration of a substance decline in an individual who had maintained prolonged heavy use of the substance. And so basically because they're not using at that time, they're starting to feel the effects and it's adversive mm -hmm. typically. So some common substance abuse disorders, and we're not going to talk about all of these, but um, would be alcohol use disorder, cannabis related disorder, hallucinogen related disorders, inhalant, opioid, sedative or hypnotics and stimulants and tobacco related disorders. So we talked about this a little bit, the dual diagnosis and how seeking safety really looks at substance use and PTSD mm -hmm. at the same time. And they think that it was really important to treat them at the same time. And um, it actually is, it's really great to treat them at the same time. So the dual diagnosis of PTSD and substance abuse is common. 12 to 34 percent of clients in substance abuse treatment have PTSD and then of them 30 to 59 percent of them were women. Wow. So a really a big, big amount of the population. Yeah. Yes. Um, so these people tend to abuse hard drugs, marijuana, prescription drugs, and alcohol. Um, some say this is to cover the emotional pain of PTSD, mm -hmm. so they're kind of self-medicating with gotcha. that substance abuse. Um, and then, unfortunately, becoming abstinent from the substance doesn't cure PTSD, and sometimes mm -hmm. it can actually make these symptoms worse. Wow. Yeah. So the treatment outcomes are worse than for other dual diagnoses, and this could be because of that. People come off of the substance, but then their PTSD symptoms get higher, and so it's just kind of like a, a continuous cycle that occurs for these individuals. Um, they're, they're vulnerable to repeated traumas, um, and this can also be a part of that downward spiral because um, the substance abuse may increase their vulnerability to new traumas, which may lead to more substance abuse. Mm -hmm. um, from the perspective of a client, PTSD symptoms may be triggers. Most women with a dual diagnosis experience childhood physical and or sexual abuse. And then for men, both typically experience crime victimization or war trauma. So it's a little bit different, the traumas, but they still have trauma. Mm -hmm. So for the treatment, most clinical programs treat each disorder independently, though like I said before, um, using an integrated treatment model is recommended by both the clinicians, researchers, and also clients say that it's more effective as well and they feel like they're more likely to succeed. Um, it's also cost effective and it's more sensitive to the client because you're not letting them, you're not taking away that substance that's been used to help them cope with the PTSD symptoms. You're helping treat both at the exact same time. So so did they treat previously PTSD and then substance abuse or did they treat them like 
at the same time, but with different therapists or in different programs. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So in the overview of Seeking Safety, it talks about how people like who went to substance abuse treatment facilities weren't even asked if they'd experienced trauma. So I think oh. that typically people go in because of their substance abuse, but then their trauma hasn't been noticed and, or like asked about, inquired about, and said then they're not getting treatment for their PTSD, just the substance abuse side of it. Hmm. So, and like what, what I was saying a minute ago is the abstinence doesn't make it better. Mm-hmm. It sometimes can make it worse. So that was okay. a good question though. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure that sometimes like people go in for PTSD and maybe the substance abuse isn't treated as well, mm-hmm. but I think it really just depends on the person. Mm-hmm. But that was a good question. So like Kayla mentioned before too, what's really neat about Seeking Safety is that they um, they account for the fact that counter-transference is really common. So even just like culturally and also like in the therapy world, um, having a substance abuse and PTSD can be, I guess, looked down upon or counter-transference is just common in that population. So it's great that Seeking Safety tries to counter that and mm-hmm. help protect the client and also the therapist from doing that to the client. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and then treatments that are, it's also really important to remember that treatments that are effective for PTSD may not be appropriate for treating substance abuse and vice versa. So going to AA is not gonna help with PTSD mm-hmm. and also taking sometimes like benzodiazepines wouldn't be effective in treating someone who also has a substance abuse mm-hmm. where it may help PTSD it doesn't go across the board so we just kind of did a really quick run through of PTSD substance abuse and also the dual diagnosis of both um so we're gonna take a quick break yeah when we come back we'll talk about um what, what looks like safety looks like perfect This podcast is brought to you by the UCO Psychology Clinic. This clinic is located on the third floor of the education building on UCO's campus. The clinic (laughs) provides evidence-based psychological services for people of all ages in a compassionate and caring environment, which is really important. They provide services like individual psychotherapy, group therapy, academic assessment and intervention, applied behavioral analysis, otherwise known as ABA, All services are provided by advanced graduate students. If you want any more information, you can contact the clinic directly at 405-974-2758. That number again is 405-974-2758. UCO Psychology Clinic. All right, guys, welcome back to Evidence-Based Talks with Tay and Kay. Um, So we've talked a little bit about seeking safety. We've touched on PTSD and substance abuse. Now we're going to talk more in depth about seeking safety. Specifically, what does it look like? So seeking safety is interesting because it can be pretty much done any way you want to do it. Um, So it can be group or individual therapy. It can be any age, race, gender, anything like that, any demographic. It can be set in an inpatient, outpatient, or residential treatments. It can be a standalone treatment or in combination with other treatments. So they can, the clients can be in like individual therapy as well as seeking safety groups. So you can use it in combination with any of those types of things. Um, It can be used for, I'm sorry, it can be used for people with both PTSD and substance abuse or only one of them. So they do not have to have both. They can have one One or the other. other. Okay, great. Okay, so it can be used in any time frame. They have done research on it being in 50 minutes and in 90 minutes. So that's kind of interesting. It can also be any amount of weekly sessions. So Hmm. they have done... Some have done two a week, some have done one a week, and there was either, there was even one study that was every other week. Okay. So, it's pretty interesting. A lot of variability. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, the actual treatment sessions are very consistent with each other. There's four parts in each session, each individual Mm -hmm. session, and we're going to talk about those really quickly. So, the first part is the check-in, which this is pretty typical of CBT. This is going to look similar to a typical CBT Mm -hmm. session. So the check-in, it's going to find out how the client is doing. There are five specific questions that you ask as the therapist. So you go in and since your last session, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. What good coping have you done? Any substance use or unsafe behavior? 
did you complete your commitment and community resource update okay something interesting about seeking safety you remember i said earlier they have uh, they pay very close attention to the language that they mm-hmm. use yeah so um they call the homework assignments commitments instead okay. of homework so they tried out um homework practice exercise skill practice and promise mm-hmm. were all tried in research mm-hmm. but the clients and the therapists felt like commitment a had the most success mm-hmm. the people actually did their commitment yeah. and b the clients thought it was um more inspiring than awesome. any other term used and then the community resource update that just looks like um if they used anything in the outside world so okay. a food pantry an aa meeting um housing things like that okay we're gonna role play um what each part of a seeking safety session would look like so first up is the check-in mm-hmm. um and so taylor is going to play the client and i'm going to play the therapist so um since our last session taylor how are you feeling um i've been feeling pretty good i feel like i've been feeling better than i have like in previous weeks okay um what good coping have you done so this week i tried to be a little bit more active i took my dog for a walk and then i also practiced some of the grounding techniques that we went over during our session okay awesome have you used any substances or had any unsafe behaviors yeah, I had a couple glasses of wine um, last week. I also, I my ex called, but I did answer his calls. Oh, perfect. Um, and did you complete your commitment? Yes, my commitment was that I wouldn't be, like, I wouldn't be around people that made me feel unsafe. Okay. And so I did that by not answering my ex's phone call. Awesome. Um, and a community resource update for us. Yeah, I went to an AA meeting as well. Perfect. So that's kind of what a check-in session would sound like. Obviously, if you were in a group session, we would go around the room and let each client talk and answer each question. But this shouldn't be very long. You shouldn't let it take any longer than five minutes per client. Right. So. That was pretty easy and to the point and gave you a lot of information to go off of for the session too. It also is really consistent. So I said across each session, they do the exact same thing in the exact same order. And they do that because they want, um, that's one of the values that has been instilled in Seeking Safety. So they want it to be very consistent to show this population that consistency really helps with things. Okay, so the next part that Seeking Safety does is a quote. So for each session, um, there's a quote that is inspirational and it engages the client emotionally. That's the biggest point. They're hoping that if the client doesn't remember anything else, they can remember that inspiration that the quote gave them Mm -hmm. later on in life. So it's very, very brief. If you're in a group session, only one person person should talk about the quote. If you're in an individual session, obviously only. That would mean a lot different things to lots of different people. And they also say that you can get very off task. So it can take you on a tangent in a whole other direction that isn't what the actual session is about. So the only question that you should ask in this is what does this quote mean to you? Okay. And then you, after that, link um, the quote to the topic. So the therapist does that part and then you move on to the next section. Great. Okay, so again, we're going to role play that for you so you can kind of hear what that sounds like. So, um, Taylor is going to be the client and I'm going to be the therapist. First, I'm going to ask Taylor to read the quote and then we'll talk about it. So, okay, Taylor, thanks for giving us that update. Um, do you want to go ahead and read the quote for today? Yeah, I can do that. It says, don't compromise yourself. You're all you've got. And it's by Janice Joplin. Okay, and so what does that quote mean to you? So I think that um, this quote to me means that a lot of times I um, don't really think highly of myself Mm -hmm. and so I don't give myself enough credit um, and I also don't like do enough for myself. So what this means to me is basically that I need to do more for me because I'm all that I have. Yeah. So that's perfect. Um, Today we're going to talk about Um, self-care. So this quote emphasizes the need to do the best that you can with your life. Just like you said. Yeah. Okay, so that was what a quote session of a, I'm sorry, quote portion of a session would look like. Okay. 
Okay, so the next part is the discussion. And this is going to be the longest part of each session. This is going to be the heart of the session. Okay. The longest part, this is where you're going to relate the topic to the client's life. Um, they're going to look through the handout for that session, look and see what information we're providing for them and kind of get a feel for it before we jump into that. Um, this way, they aren't just grasping for straws when the client starts talking. They have it in front of them and they can actually look right. and see what's going on and follow along. Yeah. Also, for each session and each handout, they provide a safe coping sheet. So essentially the safe coping sheet, it gives you your situation, what your coping is, and then the consequence of that. And mm -hmm. it has two rows, one for your old way and one for the new way that we learned in session that day. So it's really cool. Yeah. You can apply it to a lot of things. Even people not in this population right. could use something yeah. like that. So it's pretty cool. Um, so basically it just shows what the new coping skill, like the better consequences that it has yes. essentially from doing those coping skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it also puts it into perspective. They use real life situations. So mm -hmm. they would want to, the example here is I have a bad toothache. Mm -hmm. And so because of their toothache, they drink. Okay. But the Instead. new one, yes, the new, that's their old way. Right. The new way is call the dentist. Okay. So. Yeah. Better, you'll get better results from calling your dentist. Yes, than okay. you would from drinking. So we're looking at um, role-playing in, the, in their own lives as well. So they're wanting to make it applicable for them to actually be able to look at this and say, oh, okay, if this happens, this is what I should do. Oh, great. Okay, so this part will again role-play this section. This one's going to look a little bit differently just because we aren't going to go through what a whole discussion section mm -hmm. would look like. That would take way too long. Right. So um, again, Taylor's going to be the client. I'm going to be the therapist. And at this point, we will have already given her time to look through the handout. So she's already seen all of this. We're just talking about what it is afterwards. Yeah. Okay, so um, I know you've already looked at the handout for today. And so you've been looking and filling out the self-care questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn from doing the self-care questionnaire? So really what I learned is that there's a lot more to self-care than what I originally thought. Um, and so there are some things that I do, but there's a lot of things that I don't do that I could do that mm -hmm. I think would actually be really helpful for making me feel better and for doing self-care. So mm -hmm. I learned I learned a lot actually from just filling this out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was a very short sample of what kind of a discussion would look like. The therapist would ask questions specific to that client's life and say, okay, well, in your in our last role play, mm -hmm. you, you used the example of your ex called you and you didn't right. answer. So they would say something like, okay, well, how can you use that example in a self-care model? Right. Okay, and then our last section, which again, very typical of like a CBT therapy session, um, is the checkout. So this reinforces the client's progress and it also gives the therapist immediate feedback. So they also, um, they can tell them, oh, I didn't like that you did this. I think that this would be more helpful. We need to go over this. So that way for the next session, the therapist can kind of tailor the sessions to their clients. I like that they do that. Yes. It makes it a lot more, um, reinforcing because mm -hmm. the client feels like they're being heard. Yeah. I feel like it gives them a little bit more control of the yes. sessions in the future as yes. well. Yes, it does. And they can they can pick which topics are most important to them and relate them to their own lives. And right. they might have feedback for the therapist that the therapist wouldn't get anywhere else. Exactly, yeah. So it's really beneficial for both parties. Um, so you would only ask three questions during mm -hmm. the checkout session. So your three questions are name one thing you got out of today's session. What is your new commitment? And then what community resource will you call? Okay. So they want to reinforce the idea that you can, with the community resource, they want to reinforce that you have people that you can call. There are places you can go to stay safe. That's okay. what that looks like. So again, Taylor and I are going to role play this for you. Um, so this is what the checkout session would look like. Okay, Taylor. So now that we're done. We're almost ready to go. We've been talking about self-care a lot today. So what is one thing that you got out of today's session? I think that, like I said before, 
there's a lot of things that I don't do that I think I could do to help with self-care. So that's definitely something that I took from today is that there are a lot of other options that I didn't even think of as self-care that I can do to yeah. help myself feel better. Yeah. So with that being said, what do you think could be your new commitment for this week? I think that a good commitment, just thinking along the lines of self-care, is to make a list of things that I don't do self-care-wise that I can start to implement, like, before our next session. Yeah, I think that's a really great commitment. Um, And so, if anything happens that you feel unsafe, what community resource will you call this week? Um, I'd probably call my AA sponsor. Perfect. Okay, so that is... Again, just a small taste Mm -hmm. of what a checkout session would, a checkout portion, I keep saying that, what a checkout portion of a session would look like. This podcast is brought to you by Free Thought Farm. Visit www.freethoughtfarm.com for more information. Free Thought Farm, better than Farmville. So the last thing that we're going to talk about are the 25 topics that Seeking Safety has. Um, We won't talk about each of them in super great detail, but enough that you kind of get an idea of what each of them um, like have in them. So what are the five topics that you have to cover? Or they say at least that if anything else, like make sure you cover these. Like Mm -hmm. if you have to shorten the time that you have or, you Mm -hmm. know, for whatever reason. So um, Seeking Safety it can be longer or shorter than the 25 sessions. Okay. So you can shorten it to just the five that mm-hmm. you've talked about, or it can be longer than 25 mm-hmm. sessions where you go over each topic twice. Oh, great. So if you're doing the full treatment, you have to make sure that you're doing the introduction to treatment and case management first, and then safety should be second. Okay. Which makes that sense. That makes sense, yeah. Yes. Make sure and, you know that skill. Yes. I mean, you want to introduce what it is and right. all of that before you just, like, jump Let's on go. in. <laughs> But if you're only giving part of the treatment, again, you would first do the intro and then safety. Okay. Then you would do PTSD, taking back your power, when substances control you, detaching from emotional pain or grounding, and then commitment. So those are the most, the five most important and what they say you have to include if you're going to shorten it. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... We'll just go through all 25, and I'll just give a little snippet of information about each, um, but not in too much of great detail. So, also just important to note that all the topics are categorized into four different, I guess, groups of topics, and they are interpersonal topics, cognitive topics, behavioral, and then combination topics. So, just keeping that in mind, they have four main, like, essentially goals that they're kind of trying Mm -hmm. to, like, lump them in and make sure that at least you get a couple of those in each. Okay, so the first session that is done regardless is the introduction. So basically, it's really all that we just talked about a minute ago, but they're going to do the overview of the treatment, information concerning the topics covered in the treatment. Um, So they're going to kind of talk about like the 25 topics Mm -hmm. as well, or at least what they're going to be. Very briefly. Um, They're going to be told that what's really neat too about seeking safety is that even if they use, they won't be terminated. So obviously keeping in mind, like they are able to make that part of their commitment. If Mm -hmm. I understand right, that they Mm -hmm. will reduce like the intake of the substance later too. Okay, perfect. Um, And then commitment to only speaking about trauma in the current tense. So they're not going to go back and bring up all of their trauma, especially in a group setting. That's something that's kind of, I guess... It can be a trigger for right, other for people's other people. trauma. So they say not to do that in um, especially the group, but they just don't focus on the trauma as much. It's more of like how the trauma is affecting them right now. Um, and then also practical information about the treatment, where, when, who, etc. And then the agreement of confidentiality as well as the agreement to stay safe, which is probably the most important part. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the first one that we'll talk about is safety. Safety is the most important priority as far as seeking safety goes, which obviously it's in the name. Um, It teaches stages of healing from PTSD and substance abuse. It also teaches safe coping skills and also signs of recovery. Okay, so the next one that they talk about is PTSD, taking back your power. So in this one, they talk about what is PTSD because a lot of these people don't even know that they have PTSD. Mm Um, The link between PTSD and substance abuse, teaching compassionate views of the self, and problems with PTSD over time. So long-term issues that can arise from having trauma. Okay. 
The next one we'll talk about is detaching from emotional pain. Um, in this session, they talk a lot about grounding and teaching the proper skills to mm-hmm. actually do the grounding techniques. Um, and what grounding is, is it's a set of simple strategies to detach from emotional pain. So the types of grounding that they're taught are mental grounding, which would be focusing on other things. Um, so for example, thinking of all of the presidents or taking a few minutes to think about TV shows that you like to watch. Um, and this just helps to kind of get their mind off of the trauma or whatever else they were thinking about that's distressing. The next one is physical grounding and um, this has several different things they can do but one of them would be um, like holding maybe a rock in their hand and feeling the surface and really focusing on what that physical touch feels like. Is the rock rough? Is it smooth? Things like that to help get their mind off of it that way. Um, And then also soothing grounding and the soothing grounding is positive self-thought like positive self um, talk mm-hmm. and um, other skills like that. And then they also are also taught strategies for each of those. So how can you do this? Like I just named one of each, but there are several different strategies for each of those. And they go into detail about that. The next topic that it covers is when substances control you. So again, this is kind of an introduction to what substance abuse is. Um, it has a checklist on do you have a substance abuse problem? Because sometimes people don't think that they have a problem before they are actually given this information. Mm -hmm. Um, How substances affect recovery from PTSD. I know Taylor kind of touched on this earlier, Mm -hmm. how sometimes abstinence can have a lot bigger of an effect on PTSD and vice versa. Right. Um, This section, you also choose a way to give up substances. So there are three types. You can either give it up all at once, you can do an experiment and commit to giving it up for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Or you can do it gradually. So I'm going to only drink three drinks today, Mm -hmm. then two drinks tomorrow. Yes. Um, And then they also talk about how it's okay to have mixed feelings when giving up substances. And then also what the self-help groups are that are out there and what they can do for them. Awesome. The next we're going to talk about is asking for help. They're um, in this session, they're given a worksheet for how to ask for help because a lot of times it's really difficult to ask for help whenever you need it. Um, So on this worksheet, they will like answer questions like who will you talk to? What will you say whenever you're asking for help? What do you think will happen and what happened in reality? So maybe they might be um, catastrophizing and thinking, well, I'm going to ask and they're going to say no. And then it's going to be really awful and embarrassing. But then they also get the opportunity to fill out what they think will actually happen. Mm -hmm. Like in reality, what happened whenever you ask for help? I think that's really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I mean, I feel like a lot of people do that. They Mm -hmm. catastrophize and then in reality, it's like, like, oh, that Not wasn't that deal. bad. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the next topic, which this is the one that Taylor and I kind of role played with. Mm-hmm. So it's taking good care of yourself. Again, it has that self care questionnaire, which we kind of talked about a little bit, and also strategies um, to take better care of yourself. Which, I mean, if we could just talk about that for the next few minutes, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a really important thing to go over. Yes. So, yeah, I'm, I like that they do that. The next one is compassion. Um, In this session, they compare harshness versus compassion and just kind of like weigh the two and talk about each one and see what the differences are. And then also ways to increase compassion. The next is red and green flags, which I kind of think this is an interesting one. So they talk about red flags, which mean danger. Mm -hmm. And then they talk about green flags, which are safety. So they give examples of each. There's a whole list. They go through the red flags of somebody's offering me a substance right? and what the green flag would be for that as well. They also create a safety plan on this topic of what they would do if something like that happened. That's awesome. (laughs) The next one we're going to talk about is honesty. In this session, they're actually given, like, what would you do type scenarios. So, would you lie? Would you... Tell the truth. Tell the truth. You know, so on and so forth. Um, And so, they're able to, you know, one, answer honestly hopefully honestly about what they would do in that situation, but also help them. Like maybe they said that they would lie in that situation. So they also help them to think of like, how would you be more honest and why is honesty important? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is really great as well because they're not just saying like, Oh, well that's bad that you would lie. They're teaching them like Mm -hmm. why honesty is important and 
how they can begin to become more honest. Yeah. Okay, so our next topic is recovery thinking. So this is really going to have the client look at substance abuse thoughts versus recovery thoughts, and also PTSD thoughts versus recovery thoughts. They're also going to give them rethinking tools and explain why rethinking is beneficial. So taking a step back and saying, am I doing what I should be doing? Right. The next is integrating the split self. Um, So in this session, they would learn how to recognize the split self, how to utilize them for recovery, how to keep safe even when a different side of themselves starts to emerge, and then also identifying and accepting all sides of oneself. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of goes back to that mixed feelings. Right. Like one side of you might not want to give up substances while another side is like, yes, I want to Mm -hmm. be safe. And it's okay that that part of you wants Mm -hmm. to, but... Let's learn the skills that we won't actually do that. So our next topic is commitment. So this is going to explore what commitment looks like in the client's life. And it's going to teach them how to keep commitments. Mm -hmm. Um, They also identify feelings that get in the way of keeping their commitments. And they go through an action plan, which identifies a commitment that the client wants to accomplish. They actually identify that themselves. And then they go through and figure out how they can do it and how they would face the obstacles that might come about from this. Awesome. The next one is creating meaning. In this one, they complete worksheets that identify meanings in their life that are harmful and and some meanings that are healing. Um, They also rate these and identify how they can find meaning that is healing. Okay, so the next topic is setting boundaries in relationships. So they identify what healthy boundaries are. Um, They also help the clients identify if the boundaries that they have are too close or if they are too distant. Mm -hmm. So it can be both sides of the spectrum. Um, They learn how to say no in a relationship, and they learn how to say yes in a relationship, and they also learn how to get out of an abusive relationship, which can be very important, especially for people with PTSD. This one is discovery. So in this session, the clients are encouraged to use discovery to find out if their beliefs are true rather than just staying stuck in the same thought patterns. They also learn how to use discovery by asking others, um, try it and see if it works, by prediction, and then also acting as if what they are doing is the right thing to do. And then they also learn how to cope with negative feedback from others, that which is a hard, hard yes. lesson to learn. Too. Yes. The next is getting others to support your recovery, which is really important as well for recovery. Um, This goes over types of people who can influence recovery, like supportive, neutral, or destructive people, and identifying what that looks like and who that would be. Um, How to help others help you. So what do you need? And that goes back to the asking for help Mm -hmm. as well. Um, There are handouts to give to the supportive people in the client's life, um, which help them to identify ways that they can be more helpful. Um, So the client's not just having to like come up with this on their own. Mm -hmm. There's handouts actually to give um, the people in their life that can help them. And then also hotlines that can help both the client and the supportive people in their life. The next is coping with triggers. In this session, they learn what a trigger is and what maybe some of their triggers are, like to able to identify what those are, but also how to cope with the trigger. So um, change the who, what, and where to cope. Mm -hmm. So the next session is respecting your time. So in this session, the clients are actually given a blank weekly schedule and they go through and they learn how to complete a weekly schedule. How to even plan things. How how to to plan anything like that, Mm -hmm. which is very applicable right um and then they also have a checklist on how to respect your time the next one is healthy relationships they look at the healthy relationship beliefs that they have versus the unhealthy relationship beliefs that they have and they also look at how to change the unhealthy um, beliefs that they have about Mm -hmm. relationships The next is self-nurturing. So in this session, they learn safe versus unsafe self-nurturing. This is going to look different from self-care because self-care are things that you have to get done, like going to the dentist, going to the doctor, when something's wrong. Self-nurturing is going to look more like, I like to read, so I'm going to read a book. I like to do a puzzle, so I'm going to do a puzzle. Those kinds of things. They also identify a self-nurturing plan and include that in their weekly schedule. So that way they're actually planning self-nurturing time. That's great. Mm -hmm. The last session before termination is a review session. 
Um, they call it the Life Choices game. It's pretty cool because they actually have a game board. They sit down and they play a game. So they're reviewing all of the topics that they talked about, mm-hmm. the last 24 topics. Right. And then they're presented with tough situations and hard scenarios that might be actual scenarios that they have talked about mm-hmm. in previous sessions or might be scenarios that the therapist has identified. And then they're asked to respond with how they would use the best coping skills in that situation. Okay. And then the final session is the termination session. Um, In the session, the client gets to express feelings about seeking safety, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, They also finalize aftercare plans. So, you know, finding housing and Mm -hmm. other, like making sure that they have somewhere to go and like, I guess, just resources that they're going to be able to Mm -hmm. continually use. Um, They also write a letter to each client, which I think is really cool. It's kind of just to send off and really just like an affirmation of like, you can do this and encouragement as well. Um, They get a certificate of completion and it has on the certificate how many sessions of how many sessions they completed. So if they only did five, they'll have like five out of five. Or if they did all 25, you can say they completed 25 out of the 25, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And then they also um, commit to one final commitment to stay substance free, safe, to use good coping and to use all the things they learned in treatment. Which I think is pretty cool. I think that's a good ending for a treatment. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't make it as final too, because it's like, I'm still continuing Mm -hmm. this commitment. Yes. Okay, guys. So I think that is the end of our very first podcast. Yeah. We have been so excited to talk with you today about seeking safety. And we are looking forward to having some more evidence-based talks in the future. Thanks, guys. Thank you.